on that. Yep. So this comes in a perfect, well, I'll ask, almost perfect. A month ago, my horse, Kyle, came in again. She's like once a year, she does. How bad? Um, I had to have the vet out, and it was a, a very cold, windy Friday night. And, um, but I gave her Banamine. They, they gave her um, some kind of sedation and something else to help calm the contractions or whatever. And they, they did an exam on her. Um, but it's just like, okay. And they can just let her sleep off the meds and keep her in there overnight. And the next morning, she wanted out. And she ran out. Scott went in and started mocking. I'm like, Scott, wait, wait. Next thing you know, I hear him, whoa, whoa, whoa. She turned around and she come running right back into that stall. Kicking and kicking. And he had to like run to get out of the way. She was just feeling excited. Uh, yep. You know, we put her mom's horse down last year. And it's 22 seconds. Well, probably January, February time frame. Um, she called. It was mom. Um, my mom moved out here, so her horse came to live with us. And uh, I never gave a second thought where she came from. She had heated water buckets, and I don't have electricity, so I just bring the ice. So I always made sure they had water. But and I thought she was drinking, and I think that's the whole problem. Is I don't think she was drinking as much as I thought. And I would go around and, you know, clean my barnyard every day, and I'd see just piles, you know, of three, four road apples here and there. And I'm like, oh, that's just how she does. I've never <clears throat> seen how she poops before, so um, she must just poop little bits at a time. It didn't, it didn't register. And then she popped, and I called Nanny, and I'm like, I don't think it's still that, I don't think it's that bad yet, because she's still passing a little turd here and there, and she doesn't act like she's real uncomfortable, but something's off and um by one o'clock that afternoon we put her down annie came out she couldn't she gave her double doses of um uh, i had given her the oral banamine annie gave her double doses of the sedative um, and she couldn't do a rectal on her and she's like best thing for her is either send her to cornell which we couldn't afford or um her down. So it was tragic had them Hey guys, um, sorry, we're still figuring out YouTube a little bit. <laughs> so in addition to uh, all of you here in the room, there are also some people watching online. Um, so online, let us know if you have any trouble hearing us or anything. Otherwise, we'll get started. So I'm Lindsay Goodale, if you haven't come to these before. So I'm uh, a veterinarian. I'm also a lecturer and a uh, the Cornell Cooperative Extension Equine Specialist. And I'm very happy to introduce today Dr. Allison Miller. So she'll be talking about colic today, um, but this is a little slide to introduce her. So she uh, went here for vet school and graduated in 2007. Um, she then went to Vermont and Massachusetts where she practiced, and then she came back here to teach equine anatomy mostly, um, and also teaches some other uh, general anatomy here at the college, 
um, some physiology, and also is certified in veterinary acupuncture, which is what you see her doing there on the right. Um, so she does that on all species, actually. So she's um, she does a lot of uh, small animal patients, but of course horses as well. She recently did a pig. <laughs> um, and then in her spare time, she still enjoys riding. That's her on uh, an Icelandic horse um, and ponying one as well. She's tall, so it was, um, but they're sturdy. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so she's a great asset here. She's a uh, was in equine private practice for a long time, and now um, provides some complementary medicine in the clinic as well as teaching our vet students. So she's going to talk to us about um, equine colic today. And thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Never been to YouTube before, so bear with me. <laughs> okay. So as she mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about colic, um, sort of just a broad overview. How many of you are horse owners? Okay, how many of you have experienced colic before? Okay, those that are owners and have it, that's great. So just some of the things that I'm hoping to cover today, um, clinical signs of colic in case you're not familiar with them, um, some gastrointestinal anatomy, because we need to understand that to talk a little bit about some of the different causes of colic that we um, have. In particular, we're going to talk mostly about GI causes of colic or other causes, um, and then talk a little bit about diagnostics, treatment options, and then prevention at home for our horse owners. So I'm going to start right out with a gory picture. Um, so what is colic? It's just a general term for abdominal discomfort or pain. Um, and then recognizing that there are actually both intestinal and non-intestinal causes of colic. Um, but I'm going to focus primarily on intestinal. So this is a, a necropsy photo from a horse that um, colic and, and the gut twisted and lost its blood supply to this component of the gut. Um, Maybe that was a field one we had to do. So recognizing clinical signs. Um, these are probably some of the most important ones that you want to be aware of as horse owners. And they can range anywhere from mild, moderate to severe signs. They can be gradual onset um, or uh, occur a little bit quicker. So mild, you might notice pawing, stretching out, um, increased amount of time lying down, or appetite, shifting weight. Some horses will exhibit this flame and response here. Um, and then sort of more advanced severe signs are gonna be sweating, continuous rolling, persistent movement, and then getting up and down frequently. Sometimes you can't keep them standing um, when they're that painful. And then we kind of have the in-between um, signs. And a lot of this depends on the horse a little bit. Um, so certainly as veterinarians, we really rely on you knowing your horse, um, because subtle signs in a very stoic horse might actually be indicative of a severe cause of colic. So to kind of start with the anatomy a little bit. Um, so we have the human um, that I sort of started with because uh, in general, we're sort of familiar. So if we think about path of food, we're a simple stomach animal. So we have a stomach and then we have a small intestine and a large intestine um, and the horse, their large intestine is much um, more complicated than ours because they're hindgut fermenters. So because of their diet, a lot of their digestion is gonna take place um, back here. So they have a really large cecum and a really large, um, col large colon here. And I brought a prop with me if anyone wants to come and see it afterwards. So um, just you can kind of see how everything's lying out in, in the horse um, after the talk if you want to. Uh, so thinking a little bit about the spatial relationship of viscera for us. So where are these different components of the tract sitting? Um, so this is a picture of a skeleton of the horse looking from the left side. And you can see the majority of what we have here are the small intestine and the large intestine here. And their stomach is pushed way up towards their head. Um, and then we have a couple other viscera. So we have the spleen, which is going to be really important in a different kind of colic, and then a little bit of the liver on this side. From the right side, the majority of what takes up the right side of the horse is going to be the cecum. And then again, we have mostly large colon here and then a lot of liver. Okay. So there's a lot of um, 
a lot of room for things to go wrong. <laughs> okay. So in terms of the workup, so what do we expect um, when, you know, you call your vet and your vet comes out, what are we going to do? So usually we're going to start with a complete physical exam. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly encourage horse owners to become comfortable taking um, a temperature, a pulse and a respiration of their horse um, so that they can let us know that um, when they call and they are colicking. So once we come out, we're going to repeat that. Um, as well as listen to the gut sounds on both sides of the horse. So that's that's the special term, the borborygmy, in terms of how much grumbling we hear on the left side versus the right side, up high versus down low. Um, we're going to look at the horse's general um, attitude, as well as the color of its mucous membranes. So do you guys know what color mucous membranes should be normally? Yeah. So they should be pink, like a nice pink color. And then the other thing that we often will do is kind of press down on the gums, right? And then kind of make it white and then see how long it takes for the blood to, to come back. And that gives us an indication of um, what's called perfusion. So is the blood getting to the extremities or, you know, is the horse looking potentially like a little shocky? Um, and we kind of gather all this information to give us an idea of um, how stable the horse is at the time of the exam. Um, we follow that up with a rectal exam and then a nasogastric intubation. And, you know, I kind of put them in this order, recognizing that if the horse is severely colicking, we might jump to passing the tube um, if the heart rate is really high or the horse looks super, super uncomfortable. We'll talk about why we kind of skip steps sometimes. Um, but in general, if they're fairly stable, these are the steps we kind of try and do. So physical exam, rectal exam, and then, and then we tube them, okay? So rectal exam um, is always a fun conversation to have um, because I think recognizing how the anatomy is laid out helps you think about what we can feel and what we can actually do. Um, so recognize um, we are palpating through the rectum. So we're palpating structures that are beneath our arm. So we can't reach in there and pull out the impaction, um, unfortunately, because it's many, many feet in front of where our arm is feeling. So um, in general, what do we feel for when we go in? So we're checking to say, is there feces in there? And then what's its consistency? So does it look like the horse is going to break with diarrhea and that's why the horse is colicking? So is it really, really watery or is it really dry, covered with mucus that might give us an indication possibly that the transit time of that um, manure has slowed? We're also going to ask ourselves in our minds when I'm teaching vet students, I'm like, well, we kind of develop a system of like, I would say start dorsal and kind of go right and around or they'll start dorsal and go or to the top, sorry, start at the top and go to around to the left and then down into the other side. Um, so we kind of have this check mark in our mind as we're palpating. Um, and there's a limit as to how far we can feel in terms of the abdomen. So I kind of showed you everything that's on the left and the right side. We can only palpate about one third of that um, because we don't have those go-go gadget arms. Um, yeah, anybody know go-go gadget? Some people know go-go gadget. Okay, I'm getting a little bit older. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're saying, is there normal GI anatomy from what we can feel? Okay, the other thing we might feel for is gas distension. So um, if there's gas distension, the other thing we might um, start to feel are these things that kind of run on the colon in different places. We call them bands. So they're tight bands. Um, what they actually are are these longitudinal muscle fibers on the colon. And so when this fills with gas, then they might get really tight and we can kind of almost strum them um, like a guitar, which is not a good thing. <coughs> So we can feel um, generally, again, depending on the size of the horse, depending on how long our arm is, um, the base of the cecum on the right side. So we can't feel the whole cecum, just the top part. The pelvic flexure, which is a part of the large colon that kind of sits back um, towards the, the hip bones of the horse. We can feel fecal balls in the small colon, which is sort of the part of the gut right before it comes out, okay? We can feel this root of the mesentery, which is um, basically all of the blood supply to the gut comes from mostly one vessel. And that vessel um, comes from the, the top of the body and then kind of spreads out. So we can kind of feel where that vessel is coming from. 
we can feel usually the caudal pole of the left kidney. So kind of the back part towards the horse and then the, some of the spleen, not the whole spleen. So part of the kidney on the left side and, and, and the spleen. And then there's this space between the spleen and the left kidney where our colon can get trapped. Um, and usually we can kind of feel at least the, the back end of that, okay? So abnormal findings, we shouldn't normally be able to feel loops of small intestine. So if we feel those and they're kind of, um, they're like balloon animals. So when you guys put the balloon animals and they kind of are blown up like that, those are what loops of small intestine feel like. Um, and so if we go in and we feel all of that, that's not usually a good thing. We can usually feel firm ingesta, so an impaction is kind of the more common term you might hear in the large colon or parts of the cecum. We can feel the gas distension that I talked about a little bit earlier, and then those, those taut bands um, if the colon's where it's not supposed to be and if there's some sort of gas distension going on. So then after our rectal exam, depending on what we find, um, regardless of whether it's normal or abnormal, or whether we think it's normal or abnormal, um, we're gonna pass a tube. Uh, does anybody know why we would wanna pass a tube on a colicum horse? <laughs> Any ideas? No? Okay. So the, the reason we want to pass a tube is horses can't vomit. Okay. So that's kind of a big difference with some of our domestic species is they can't vomit. So things that can happen, right? So fluid can back up on their stomach. And if we don't pass a tube in there to get that fluid out, that stomach can rupture. And that is sort of an end game because um, it's much harder. We can't access the stomach. I showed you where it was um, on the left side of the horse. We can't go in there and really fix the stomach. So if there's any risk of rupture, we want to get a tube in there. So it can, it can help us diagnose what might be going on. Um, we're going to pump fluid in. Uh, like you're siphoning out a gas tank and we want to see are we getting more fluid out than we're putting in and if we are that might give an indication that fluids backing up on the <laughs> stomach and there might be an issue and that next part of the gut the small intestine so something's stuck and not moving or there's something going on with the gut where it doesn't want to move. Um, the other thing we can do is we can use it as a treatment so if we pass the tube and we figure out what might be going on or we don't think there's any backup, then we can administer different things via a tube um, to treat possible causes of colic. And we're gonna talk about the different causes of colic and the different things we can put in the tube in a little bit. So in terms of technique, um, I always like to tell horse owners what they can do to help their vet. So um, in terms of, of what we're trying to do is we're gonna try and pass it kind of as low in the nose as we can. Um, so we hopefully don't get a bloody nose, okay? So um, usually you kind of holding the head down helps a lot. And then once we get the tube to a certain point, we'll ask you to kind of flex their neck as, as low as you can um, as we turn the tube and try and get them to swallow it. And once they swallow it, it makes it a little bit easier. So we look on the left side of the neck, okay, to see is it in the esophagus. And a lot of times we can see it moving. If we can't see it, we can palpate it. And the other thing we often do, we'll suck, we'll suck back on the tube because we should get negative pressure. That esophagus should collapse down onto the tube if we're in the right spot, okay? Coughing doesn't necessarily mean anything. It can give us an indication, um, but we wanna use all of those other uh, tools that we have to say, are we in the esophagus or are we in um, the wind tube that's gonna go down to the lungs, okay? So I already said more fluid might indicate a problem closer to the stomach, in which case we're probably not going to give them extra fluid through the tube. Um, depending on how much extra fluid we get out, um, your vet might recommend sending that horse to a surgical facility, um, either for further workup um, or to make sure that they don't need surgery or if there is a medical reason for that um, for additional treatment. And we usually will ship them with a tube in place because of that risk of rupture. Okay, So we always traveled with like four or five tubes and then would send them um, and get them back eventually. Okay. So additional diagnostics that can be done um, 
sometimes on the farm, a lot of times we're going to be at, in a hospital setting, uh, would be ultrasound. So abdominal ultrasound, where we're going to take a probe and we kind of run it in different parts in the abdomen. And there's different things that we can see in different parts that should be normal or could be abnormal. So this is, this is an abnormal ultrasound finding here. And all it's kind of showing is that the muscle that separates uh, the thorax, so the chest area from the abdominal cavity, that muscle has torn and there are small, there are gut contents in where the lungs are supposed to be. And that's, that's not good. Okay. So that can make the horse seem a little bit colicky, actually a lot bit colicky. And it's something that we could see on an ultrasound that would give us an idea of what might be going on. Um, other things we can look at on ultrasound would be the thickness of the intestine. So if the intestine is twisted and can't drain its blood supply, it might get thickened and eventually die. And we can kind of see that on an ultrasound. We can get an idea of motility of the gut. So is it moving or is it kind of just sitting there <laughs> and not moving or just moving a little bit? Um, and then we can kind of see if guts are, are moved into an incorrect position sometimes when we get lucky. So thickness, motility, different types of entrapments. Um, radiographs or x-rays, not commonly done just because um, the horse is so large to be able to shoot enough x-rays to get through their entire abdomen is, is a really hard thing to do, certainly in the field, um, but even in, in a referral sent setting. Um, the one time when we might do that would be um, if we're suspicious of something called an enterolith, which is basically like a ball, like a stone in the gut. Um, and that can show up on an x-ray as like a bright white structure, okay? Other diagnostics that you might hear mentioned or seen done um, is this thing called an abdominocentesis or a belly tap. So surrounding all of these, um, the guts and the abdomen normally should be just a really small amount of fluid. And that fluid can give us an idea of what might be going on um, to cause that colic GI wise. Um, these are sort of some examples of abnormal belly taps that we could get. So when the bowel is strangulating, meaning that it's kind of lost its blood supply and might be dying, we can kind of get more of a red colored tap. Um, if we have rupture, you might see actual food contaminants in your tap. Um, sometimes the spleen likes to get in the way when we tap ventrally and we can get a little bit of blood in our tap, in which case we might repeat it to see is this actual blood or did we just kind of hit a structure that was in the way as we were going in. And then peritonitis um, is something where we kind of have an increased cell count. There's a lot of different reasons for it. And then what we'll do is we'll take this fluid and then we can run different diagnostics on it to give us an idea of what might be going on. <coughs> Has anybody seen a belly tap done? Yeah. So were the, was it done at the farm or was it done? It was done here. Okay. And you've seen one too? Was it done at the farm or here? It was here. My horse was getting colic. Surgery. It was here. Okay. Huh? So it can be done in the field too. Um, you might see it done in the field. So the really kind of fun, well, I think the fun stuff to talk about are the different types of colic. Um, and so I kind of broke it down, just recognizing there are non-intestinal causes of colic. Um, so uh, pregnant pregnant mare can have a, uh, the uterus tours, um, so it can twist and they, that can happen really quickly and be uncomfortable. Um, bladder stones, so they can have stones in their bladder can make them colicky. Um, some other different ones, but the ones I'm gonna focus on tonight are intestinal causes, partly because I have cool videos, partly because that's mostly um, what we see most commonly, and then certainly what you may see as a horse owner, hopefully not, but maybe, okay, um, to be familiar with. So to start with, um, one of the types of colic, when we think about it just as a category, is obstruction. Um, and that obstruction can be a strangulating obstruction, meaning we've, we've um, strangulated the blood supply or non-strangulating, okay? And this would be an example of a strangulating lesion where this is healthy gut in colic surgery, and this is all not healthy gut here, okay? So something's happened to this intestine that's kind of cut off the blood supply to this region here, okay? Um, and then that obstruction might be inside the lumen, so inside the lining of the gut or outside the lining of the gut. 
So different types of intraluminal obstructions um, that we will sometimes see that you can think about in terms of um, thinking about prevention would be sand or gravel. It, are you guys aware about sand colic or gravel colic? Okay. So when we talk about prevention, what might be something that we can do to hopefully avoid sand or gravel colic? Yeah. You put your hay in a hay bag. Yeah, so you can put your hay on a hay bag um, off the ground somehow, right, in a feeder or a hay bag so that they're not eating it. Does anyone know of something else we can use? Um, you're from the South. Psyllium. Psyllium, yeah. So Metamucil, um, people will, there's different ways to kind of do a sand clearing thing to try and clear the sand that's in there. Do you guys know how we test for sand in the feces? You want to know? Do you? Yeah, um, so taking a rectal sample of the feces and looking, I think you add water to it, and then yep. looking what um, sand goes to the bottom of the yep. glove. And so, so you take a sample of feces, you kind of mash it up in a big rectal sleeve with some water, and you kind of hang it by the stall side, and you kind of wait for things to sediment out. And we can see if there's an extra sand or, or gravel in there. So that's something, yep. So I, I'm out like in Mecklenburg and it's mostly grass and weeds and stuff. And so I, I know I've heard in about sand colic before, but is it, I'm like, where's their sand? So is this like in places where they're fed their hay on like a sand lot? Sand lot or, or gravel. I mean, so, so if it's mostly grass, where you are, not necessarily, but if you if you put the hay down, you kind of see there's a, when you pull the hay up and you kind of clean under there. If there's grant, if there's um like a sand or like a sooty stuff thing, then they can still have it here. Not as not as common, I guess, as you would say in the south, um, but it can certainly still happen here. And a lot of the um, the fecal samples that we see at the DL in terms of looking at parasite count and everything like that, they'll make comments if they see sand or gravel in the fecal samples. The other thing you can do is, is get a sleeve from your vet and you can just do it on, on your stall side to kind of test and see. Most of my ground is, is clay, so I, I don't think I get that. But that's why I was just wondering, where does the sand come from? The ground. I mean, I yeah. don't have sand typically. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Big amounts of it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So other example of intraluminal obstruction would be feed. So horses that have dental issues, right, that are maybe not chewing as well as they should, um, and they can have some, some food impaction or at this time of year, right, not drinking enough water um, with the temperature change. I know it's not necessarily, but, you know, they're not wanting to drink that cold water, so their water intake kind of goes down and things get a little bit dehydrated. Ascrid impactions. So this is this is th these are worms, right? So they're nematodes. Tends to be younger horses, um, but they can when they they're big, they get big, and there's lots of them, and they can build up in a part of the the small intestine and cause basically an impaction that makes that horse colic. Um, a lot of times, it ends up going to surgery to to get all those worms out, which is always kind of cool, depending on what you think is cool. Uh, <laughs> sorry, maybe not. Um, the enterolists we talked about, um, not as common around here, but these these are some examples of enterolists on a, on a vet's desk. I mean, when you find one, you, you keep it. Um, <laughs> this is the example of one on an x-ray or a radiograph. So we kind of talked about, see the big white circle structure here would be suspicious, okay? Foreign bodies, so baling twine, right? So we're always kind of throwing the hay out, make sure we get the baling twine out of there. Um, and we talked about the impaction. And so ascrids and feed can certainly form an, uh, an impaction. They're just different types of impactions. Um, so these are some of the videos um, that I have. So have you guys seen these at all, the glass horse? anatomy of the, of the equine abdomen. So I like to use these to teach students um, and to teach clients in terms of um, what, what we're feeling or what we're treating. Um, used to carry it with me in the truck uh, so to try and explain it as we're kind of doing it. So in terms of what is an impaction, accumulation of dehydrated ingesta, there are common locations for us. Um, so we kind of saw this is the GI gut, which is all kind of stretched out and twisted and goes in lots of terms. Um, and so the areas where we have uh, 
180 degree turns or going from a really big area to a really small area of gut. Those are common areas where we see impactions, one of which is the pelvic flexure, which I'm going to kind of show here. So this is the pelvic flexure that I sort of mentioned. We can palpate on a rectal exam. So here's the rectum up here. So this is where we'd be putting our arm in and kind of feeling below to see what we feel. Uh, and basically it's not super exciting, but we kind of zoom in. Here's our pelvic flexure and it just starts to fill with this firm ingesta and we can palpate that with a rectal exam and it can give us an idea this horse is colicking and you might hear your vet say it's dentable. So can I like kind of dent it with my finger, meaning it might be a softer impaction versus it's rock hard. And when I press down on it, like there's no give whatsoever. Okay. And just to orient you a little bit too. So this is left side of the horse. So we kind of saw the stomach up here, the spleen, um, the small colon, which is the part right before the rectum, and a whole lot of small intestine that we shouldn't normally feel, okay? So what, when we have the impaction, that could make it prone. So now, the, now this large colon, the large intestine, is filled with a whole lot of ingesta. So it's much heavier, and so it can move because it's not anchored anywhere, okay? <clears throat> Other, um, so an example of an extraluminal obstruction that I think is fairly common are these lipomas. So this is basically a, a tumor of fat. Um, and oftentimes what happens is it forms what's called this pedicle. So we, we call these pedunculated lipomas. It's like a fat lollipop. So this is your <laughs> lollipop part and this is your stock. Okay, and what can happen is that little fat thing can kind of go around and our little stock here can kind of just twist around the gut and will affect the blood supply to the gut. So the lipomas that have this stock to them are a little bit more dangerous than the lipomas that just kind of form in here that are just little fat balls, okay? So those, I would say, are, are kind of common um, extra luminal obstructions, um, often need to go to, to surgery. Um, actually, we'll have to go to surgery to fix them. Okay. Um, neoplasia, so a tumor of some sort. Yes, the lipoma is a tumor. Um, but if we have other tumors either within the wall of the intestine or outside of the wall, again, fairly rare-ish in horses um, compared to other species. Um, but they can also affect movement of the of the gut here. Another extra luminal obstruction we can have is this thing called an intussusception. So an intussusception is basically where one piece of gut telescopes into the other. So if you take your sleeve, and you kind of like move it like this, okay? And one part of the gut telescopes into the other one. And eventually what happens is the part of the gut that telescopes in, it gets kind of cramped in there and the blood supply can't drain out of that region of gut. And so sometimes that part can die. And then certainly you see this uh, lumen where the, where the contents are, it, stuff can't move forward, okay? So things that could possibly result in an intussusception, one of the more common common-ish ones, depending on who you talk to, would be tapeworms, um, we think can affect the motility in a specific region of the gut and then result in one part of the gut telescoping into another part of the gut. So one of the prevention things we'll talk about is deworming, because that's really important, right? Uh, so other extra luminal obstructions would be volvulus or torsion. Um, it's a little bit of a, an anatomy terminology thing. So because I teach anatomy, I have to kind of throw it in there. Uh, the volvulus, because a lot of times they're used interchangeably, um, and you guys can call it whatever you want, but the vet students, I make them know the difference. So a volvulus is when the intestine twists around its mesentery. So the mesentery kind of suspends it from the back of the horse. And a lot of times the blood flow comes through here, the blood vessels do. So they can have a volvulus where it kind of basically spins around and then the blood supply gets cut off. The other is um, a torsion where pieces of intestine kind of twist around each other. And again, the blood supply uh, usually gets cut off. Okay. So torsion, one of the more, well, more common ones that we think about is called a large colon torsion, where the two components of the large colon, the dorsal and the ventral, so the top and the bottom one, they twist around themselves. Um, 
Sometimes we'll see this in mares that have just fold because now there's a whole lot of space in here because baby's gone, right? And colon can kind of do whatever it wants. It gets a little crazy. Okay. So this is going to zoom in a little bit. So again, just to orient you, we're going to kind of zoom in. So here's, do you guys remember what this is called? This part's called pelvic flexure, right? So this is the large colon, two kind of components of it. And this is going to be our cecum. So we're going to kind of zoom over to the right side to see our dorsal or our top part of the colon and the ventral part of the colon twist around itself. Okay. Um, and then what happens because I said the blood supply is there. So it turns purple and black and looks really awful because it loses its blood supply. And that, that first picture that I showed you that I jumped right into the, the goriness, that horse had a large colon torsion, um, had gone to colic surgery and then had retorsed um, and couldn't get to the clinic in enough time before she had actually ruptured um, by the time we got to her. So um, pretty serious, uh, need surgery to correct it. Often these guys are really, really painful. So these are often the ones that are throwing themselves on the ground. It happens often very quickly. Um, whoops, oh, I have two pictures, two videos of it, I guess. Just to look at it from a different angle, maybe. No, but I guess it's, oh yeah, so it's a different one. So you kind of see the colon twist like this. This is to kind of show um, from the back end what you what we might feel as vet. So we might feel all of this gas distension and that part of the gut in the wrong place. Um, and then these bands associated with the colon get really, really <coughs> tight. <coughs> Any questions so far? Um, other types of colic that we might see are called displacements. So the colon can move in a different direction again, because it can kind of go wherever it wants. Um, <coughs> one of the types of displacements we see is our right dorsal displacement, where that the dorsal and ventral colon displace over to the right side between the cecum and the body wall. We often need to take these guys to surgery. Um, sometimes they can respond to medical therapy that we'll talk about in a little bit. So here again is our pelvic flexure. So this is one of those times where possibly um, we have the impaction. It's much heavier. Maybe the colon wants to move forward a little bit. Um, so that would could be a possibility in terms of if it weighs more. Just snakes over to the right side and kind of gets stuck between our cecum and the body wall. And so we'll feel right bands heading across where we normally aren't gonna feel a band, okay? Another, so we have a right dorsal displacement. We can have a left dorsal displacement on the other side. And this is more commonly called a nephrosplenic entrapment. Has anybody heard about nephrosplenic entrapments before? Yeah, no, okay. Um, so our ventral and dorsal colons <laughs> get stuck between the spleen here and that left kidney. So that was why it was important. Normally we can feel our spleen and our left kidney a little bit, but with the colon's there and get stuck, right? It's gonna be much harder to feel the left kidney and we're gonna have a big colon in the way. So what this is showing what happens when the colon gets stuck up there is that it cuts the, the blood supply to the spleen. It can no longer drain out of the spleen. So the spleen gets bigger and bigger, and then it helps further trap the colon um, up in that space. Okay, so one of the treatments we can give actually kind of causes that <coughs> spleen to shrink a little bit. And then we try and jog the horse and basically jiggle the colon off that space, okay? We're very inventive. <laughs> it works sometimes. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't work, okay. Question? Yes, yep. So maybe you're gonna cover this later, but how does all that movement occur in there? How does it twist back on itself and flip over? And move over the others? How does all that happen? It's just, um, with a, so it ha it's, one of the vet students um, <coughs> said that horses were the animals that Darwin forgot. Um, <laughs> and so, Partly um, it's their anatomy um, in terms of they have all like, so that they've um, adapted, right, to be high gut fermenters and deal with the diet that they have, right? So they need much more gut to digest um, the roughage diet essentially. And what happens um, because of that is that now we have all of this gut 
kind of free moving and it can kind of do what it wants, unfortunately. I mean, there's things that we can try and do to prevent things from happening, but even if we have the absolute best husbandry in the world, um, they can still colic with, for no reason. I mean, for no reason, it can just happen. Um, is there any reason we don't see it more or is a lot of the self-correcting before we catch it? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if we know if it self-corrects. I mean, I think possibly some horses, you know, maybe if they have mild impactions and we, so, so um, I, then when we come to the prevention, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, medical management. So, so sometimes, um, people will administer pain medications on the farm and not necessarily call a vet, right? So we don't necessarily, and then that horse is fine, does better, resolves, maybe it had a gas bubble, you know, and it kind of moves on with its life and we never see it as a veterinary. So we, like, we never know what that was. So I guess part of it's like, I'm wondering, are there cases, like, do we only see the worst of the worst, right? So we, do we only see the ones where there's something wrong. Certainly at a referral hospital like Cornell, we see a lot of severe colics either that need aggressive medical management or that actually need surgery in the field. So in practice, like I went from a referral hospital for my internship to, to clinical practice. I'm like, wait, 95% of them do okay um, in the field with a little bit of banamine and a little like tubing and then I never see them again. So I, I don't know. I don't have a good answer to your question. I don't know if we're just not seeing them or if some of them just kind of work through whatever they work through during the night when we're sleeping and then the next morning they're okay. Um, it's, it's, no, I don't, yeah, don't have a good answer to your question. Sorry. Yeah. So my horse, when she collected and spent five days here, they tell me that her colon displaced kind of up and over uh -huh. and she impacted really bad. She never, she didn't require surgery. Um, they pumped her every day with fluids. Lots of fluids. And, We're talking um, about medical, they, yeah. you know, yeah. in their nose and yep. the IVs. And, yep. and I guess it, it kind of resolved. I was very lucky. Yeah. Um, but, but they, when I took her home, they said, we still, she's still got poop in there. We don't know where it is, you know, where she's hiding it, but she's still, but she resolved. And, yep. and I still like once a year have a gas kind of colic with her yep. ever since, but nothing major like that. So yeah. is that probably what happened to her? I don't know if it was this one or the other one. Um, and sometimes like I've had some where I'm like, I can't find the pelvic flexure. So I'm like, it's not on the right. It's not on the left. Like, is it just really far forward? And I can't, cause we remember that kind of goes back to the rectal exam. Like we can only feel one third of the abdomen if we're lucky. And so with her, it's like, well, where's the poop it's somewhere, but we can't feel it. And sometimes that happens um, on the rectal exam is like, where's the colon? I'm not sure we're going to treat it like this for now and then kind of see what happens. And so I don't know what, which one it was, okay. one, of the, one of the two of them. And then it sounds like she had aggressive medical management and luckily responded to that. So thank you. Um, a lot of them do. <clears throat> um, another sort of thing to think about is what's called this apoplectic foramen. So again, horses have a poor design, um, but we love them them a lot and there are little um there's a little kind of area right here so this is looking on the right side of the horse um these are the large intestine this is a bit of the small intestine here and basically a piece of the small intestine um, from the other side can kind of go through this little hole or slit and it just kind of travels through again, not necessarily a reason. Um, uh, an older paper showed us suggested that cribbing horses were at a heightened risk um, because they suck wind. Um, and then some different breeds possibly have like a large, like the epiploic foramen either gets a little bit bigger with age or some breeds possibly um, are more prone to this, this, um, this type of colic. So small intestine kind of goes in there and gets trapped. So I have a video, I actually it wasn't on the PowerPoint I sent you, Sarah, so I'm sorry if it doesn't show up. Um, so this is giving you an example of what happens. It's not exactly the epiploic foramen it's gonna go through. So there's a little slit here. So we're gonna zoom in and we'll pretend this is the epiploic foramen. Basically there's the, just a little slit that happened in the mesentery. And so the small intestine kind of snakes through and it's happy initially going through, but then too much of it rushes in, kind of crowds out the rest of it. 
And then what happens is that um, the blood gets to the gut and then the blood can't leave the gut, okay? So veins collapse first and things kind of get cut off and eventually that gut can die. Um, it can take time to show um, clinical signs from this apoplogic foramen because it's it's a black hole. So, it, so the gut is sort of trapped in a space and we don't see changes to the fluid, the, the belly tap fluid necessarily, um, until it's like a little bit more progressed, just because it is sort of isolated in the body, if that makes sense. Okay, any questions? Those are the fun, fun colleagues videos. Um, so I have to mention other, other kinds because I think, you know, we often see them in the field and you guys might deal with them. So you talked a little bit about gas colic, um, also called possibly hypermotility colic or spasmodic colic. Um, a lot of these, we don't necessarily know why they happen. Um, and they often respond to medication sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't, but some, a lot of times it does. And then we have hypomotility, meaning things that aren't moving. And so we often, so this is a horse and colic surgery. So this is often how we'll position them. So they're gonna be in on their back. Um, we make a big clipping job here, um, lots of scrubbing. And there's, a, there's an incision kind of right down the middle. And it's a pretty big incision to be able to get all those guts out and, and look at them. So, after colic surgery, depending on what's done, um, you know, that gut is manipulated a lot in surgery. Sometimes we have to take pieces of the dead gut out and then put the two good pieces back together. And a lot of times we might deal with this post-operative ileus, um, which is where this part of the gut might be moving and this part might not be, okay? So for whatever reason, either from manipulation or because of what happened, um, things just aren't moving. And then sometimes transiently, if we fast them, they'll have a little bit of decreased motility just because we're not stimulating um, the gut movement with food. Okay, so treatment, I wanna cover a little bit of that. So you can expect it again, gory picture, actually not that bad at this point. So pain control. Um, so the most common medication that we give is banamine or flunixin megalamine. This is paste, um, which I encourage all horse owners to have on farm, um, just in case of an emergency. Uh, and oral paste is better administered um, if you're comfortable doing IV. So I know a lot of um, trainers that are comfortable giving intravenous medication. Um, the IV kicks in a little bit faster than the oral. Um, this is a reminder to never give banamine in the muscle if you can avoid it. Um, because we can have some consequences associated with administration in the muscle where a bacteria that doesn't like oxygen will grow as a result of an IM injection. It doesn't, it's not just banamine, there are others, yep. Probably you should say that the bottle says it can be given in the muscle. It does say it can be given in the muscle. Just um, don't do it. <laughs> just don't do it. Uh, there, I mean, there have been times where if they're thrashing on the and I mean I've done it once or twice. Don't tell anybody. Um, but but uh, luckily I didn't have any consequences. But it shouldn't. I mean, ideally, never ever ever give it. Um, so fluoxetine, oral paste, have on hand. Um, most horses. So it's it's there's three doses in a tube. So each one of these little things is. 250 pounds, so this is a 500 pound dose, 750, 1,000, um, and you're gonna dose your horse based off of weight. I always encourage people, please, please, please call your vet, even if you're gonna give it, even if you don't want them to come, just so that they know that your horse is a little bit colicky and you're administering banamine, you're gonna monitor them, um, and we can at least kind of field over the phone and have you on our radar. Um, I always had clients that that would do that. And, and it's, I think it's, I mean, it's appreciated to kind of know what's going on um, and not, not to redose it. So it's 12 hours. So don't give them multiple doses and then kind of call um, muscle relaxant. We might give for spasmodic colics is called buscapan. Um, so that has a little bit of a transient effect. The thing we always kind of keep in mind with this is that we often will have an increase in heart rate because of the, the mode of action of how it acts on the gut. Um, so we always take the heart rate ideally before we give the buscapan, so just so we have an idea of what it was before the medication. 
If they're very painful, we can also administer sedatives. Um, but again, if we're administering pain control, possibly in multiple modalities, so possibly banamine, possible giving some muscle relaxes, possible giving sedatives, and that horse is continuing to break out of that sedation um, and not be comfortable, this is often um, an indication that there's something going on that requires a referral for either aggressive medical management or surgical intervention. Um, other medical management that we might do on the farm or even aggressive medical management in the hospital are cathartics to help things get moving um, to increase fecal water content. So mineral oil, um, we used to use a lot thinking it kind of lubed stuff and moved it along. Um, we think more now it's going to just give us a marker of when we administered it, right? So we can kind of see uh, is the is the poop glistening to say, oh, the oil's passing. Sometimes the oil passes right around that apaction and out. Um, so sometimes we'll, we'll administer it mostly as a marker. Um, Epsom salt. So we'll give Epsom salts again through the tube. So this is, we have the NG tube in, we've checked. We can kind of give some things if we want to. So the Epsom salt will draw water in to the gut. Um, we already sort of mentioned psyllium for uh, possible SAM colic, so we'll administer that. Mm -hmm. Saw more of that in Virginia, but. Uh, so other things that we can do on the farm are fluid. So usually we'll do um, like a bolus on the farm, right? So we're not gonna have this hookup, this, we're not gonna have this setup ability in the farm. This is a fluid pump here, which kind of helps monitor how much fluid is administered to that animal during a period of time, or there might be additional pain medication or um, something that's gonna help things move like a lidocaine constant rate infusion. That's what CRI stands for. So that kind of controls the rate of administration. Okay, so we could give fluids if the horse has diarrhea to try and keep them hydrated. Um, if they're refluxing, still having a tube in place. Okay, um, impactions to try and hydrate, which it sounds like your, your horse had. And we can give those intravenously through a catheter or um, by mouth through the NG tube. Okay. Other things that we might try medical management wise, especially if surgery is not an option, um, would be this thing called trocarization, where essentially we stick a needle in a portion of the gut to try and deflate it. So what this is sort of showing is someone's arm in the rectum here. So here's the hip and they're pressing this gas filled structure up against the wall. And then either they or someone else is sticking a needle sterilely prepped, ideally, um, through the skin to, to try and decompress this. And that hope of that is like, if things are displaced and you have a lot of gas, you know, can we deflate it and allow the, something to move back again? Um, not, a, not a guarantee. And then certainly you then have a little puncture in the gut, um, which could cause issues too. But and then treatment surgery, I would say, um, might be indicated certainly if we have uncontrolled or recurring pain that we talked about. So they're breaking through those pain medications over and over again, or if it's a very violent colic and it happened all of a sudden, it's not usually a good sign. Um, horses with red or cyanotic, which are blue, that's blue mucous membranes, um, are not a good sign. Uh, if we on our rectal exam, we're suspicious of a surgical disorder. So if we see, if we feel a lot of small intestine, dilated loops of small intestine, we're getting reflux, even if we're not getting reflux, um, we might be concerned that that horse has something that's going to require surgery to fix it. Um, a really distended abdomen, so everything's filled up with gas and like you can't even get your arm in to palpate what might be going on. Um, abnormal belly taps, some of those abnormal belly taps we talked about earlier. Um, could indicate that some of the bowel is dead um, or if the bowel is ruptured, you know, we aren't necessarily going to be able to fix that. Um, and then 48 hours of unresolved colic symptoms or clinical signs might be an indication that that horse has something going on that we just can't palpate um, by rectum or see with imaging. So just to kind of give you an idea of surgery, you know, what we're, what we're doing or looking at, so I sort of showed you the picture of the horse on its back and we make this big incision down the middle to get out all the gut. Okay. And even if we know what's going on or we're, we know exactly where the problem is, 
in colic surgery, they're going to run that entire gut. So they're going to go through everything that they can look at and see and exteriorize um, to make sure there's not anything going on and to assess the health of that bowel. Sometimes um, we do what's called an enterotomy, which is where <coughs> you kind of uh, make an incision. This is in the pelvic flexure and you get all the gut, all the ingesta out into multiple garbage bags or garbage cans full uh, so that, you know, if there's an impaction or something happened and we want to, again, kind of drain it back in there, drain everything out um, before we put it back in, we'll do what's called that this enterotomy and then sew it back up again. Okay. So prevention, now that I just scared about everything that could happen, um, prevention. So what can we do as horse owners to avoid colic from happening? Um, always having fresh water available, uh, especially now in the winter, things freeze over. Um, they don't like this. Well, my horses never like the super ice cold water. They like warmer water. Um, and so making sure we have fresh available uh, fresh water available at all times. Pasture turnout is helpful. I know it's not always necessarily po possible in some situations. Um, if the footing's bad, if um, we're limited in terms of what pastures we can use, um, but certainly having like a routine for those horses on a daily basis. Like every day I go out for a couple of hours in the morning and then I come in and then I go out at night or, you know, certain, certain times of the day I go out. Um, avoid feeding on the ground in sandy areas or placing a mat underneath it. So we kind of already talked about that part. Um, little grain as possible. So this is a little bit horse dependent um, and we can have a whole conversation about nutrition. Have you done nutrition yet? Okay, so they did nutrition. Um, so our one of our nutritionists here is very much like, well, they just most horses just need hay, um, and and unless they're really high competitive animals or um, older horses, you know, dentition issues, metabolic. I mean, there's lots of reasons why horses also need grain, but in terms of trying to have forage available to them um, as much as possible. Monitoring horses that have had a recent change in routine. So um, has the hay changed? Has grain changed? Has the mare, has the mare just fold? Um, have they just moved to a new farm? Um, did they go to a show? There, there was different water at the show and now they're coming back. Um, so anytime they have a change in a routine, they're, they're at risk of, of colic. Routine dental care. So at least once a year, have your vet assess your horse and possibly do um, <coughs> dental equilibration or floating if needed to keep those sharp points down and make sure that they have a good grinding surface to chew. Um, have an effective parasite control program. Um, so making sure we're doing targeted deworming based off of fecals and based off of, you know, what, what is happening on the farm. So is it a breeding farm with lots of brood mares and foals? Do we have a lot of high shedders or do we have a lot of low shedders and we're rotating pastures and there's less um, exposure to different, different parasites, making sure we deworm at least once a year for tapeworms. Cause we now know that that telescopes in the gut. Okay. Um, knowing the horse. So you guys as horse owners, are probably um, the most important in this equation because you know your animal and you're going to know when something's wrong and we listen to you when that when that happens because you know your animal better than we do um, and then monitoring brood mares especially those that have colic previously so any horse that's colic previously is going to be important to monitor but brood mares after foaling especially that's it. These are my children being brainwashed with horses again. <laughs> um, so it starts early. Uh, so do, I want to open it to any questions that you guys might have, or if you want to play with a colon here, <laughs> classinated. Um, yes. Yep. If you have to send your horse into surgery for that, um, I know that like if you have an abdominal surgery, adhesions are a concern, mm -hmm. and horses are train wrecks anyway. What's a typical recovery? I mean, do they usually recover pretty well after a surgery or? Um, so I think, so there was a paper, so it depends on, I guess, the type of surgery. So is it small intestinal? Is it large intestinal? Do we have to resect anything? Do we not have to resect anything? Do we have an incision in the bowel? Do we not have an incision in the bowel? Um, how stable was that horse going into surgery? So there, there's a, certainly a lot that kind of factors into it. Um, I'll give you a general, right, in terms of, you know, how long do they stay in the hospital? It could be anywhere for, from five to seven days, and then they go home. They're going to have small, like, stall, small paddock 
for a period of time because basically what we're, we want to have happen is have the abdominal body wall heal before we ask them to do anything because you know we make this incision and like all of this has to heal to support all of that gut um in terms of adhesion formation, um, there's lots of things that are done. Well, there are things that are done during surgery to try and minimize. So gentle tissue handling, um, this belly jelly stuff um, to try and help um, handling it gently and then to try and minimize adhesion formation. It can certainly still, it can happen. Um, you're not wrong that it, that it can't not happen. Certainly the, the longer we get out from surgery, the better um, we have. And most most horses, like a large percentage of them, can go back to their, their regular amount of work um, at a period of time. Just kind of a follow-up. Are you finding that the horses that you do surgery on, do they um, continue to have recurring colics? And I mean, do you see them more than once? Mm -hmm. so I'm just trying was, to weigh the risks of, yeah. you know, the cost of the surgery yeah. versus sending my horse in to get the surgery, but now two years later, I'm doing it again and again and yep. again because the problems just keep accumulating. Kind of um, I don't have numbers, I guess I would. I know that there are a number of papers that say percentage wise, like in terms of how many months or years you get out post colic surgery, like the percentage goes down. But I think it, in terms of them it colicking again, um, but again, I think it sort of depends on the type of surgery, what happened, you know? So did we, did we open the gut? And then now is there a risk that like that gut's going to heal and then there's going to be like a narrowing of that gut and there's no way to predict that'll happen. But we could say, well, we opened it, you know, it's like a small percentage, you know, that might happen over time. Some horses um, will repetitively uh, get that left dorsal displacement where the colon gets stuck between the spleen and that left kidney. And it basically kind of stretches that space out. So what um, will happen, I think if they've done it twice is they'll, they, they ablate the space. So they put something there so that space doesn't exist anymore. So the colon can't go up and get stuck there. Um, so again, it's, I think it sort of depends on the horse, the stability, like what was done. So it's hard to say exact, like this, these are the numbers that, that we have. And I'm not a surgeon, um, not a surgeon. So the surgeons could so say after the, the surgery, surgeons could say, we yeah, had to do this certain yes. thing and next time you probably aren't going to want to opt for surgery because it's not going to possibly. I mean, and, and sometimes, sometimes there's always the option where, you know, we open them up and then they come back and talk to the owner and say, this is what we're seeing, or this is what's here. Like, do we, do you want to continue? I, I mean, I've had that definitely happen and you were in surgery for Whoa, way time. longer. So, so, so she taught me, <laughs> she was my colic crew leader. So, so I, I'm sorry, like, but in terms of, in terms of that, like, I mean, I know that, that there were people that would step out and yeah, kind of talk to the owner I and talk to the owner. You make a decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, with my own horse and I worked there for years, I watched a lot of colic surgeries, good ones, bad ones. My own horse, I picked an age. All three of my horses, I picked an age when I said, okay, I'll get to this point. And beyond that, I will not do colic surgery. My first horse, I lost to a, to a strangle a lipoma, and she ended up with 21 feet of dead bowel. And I had decided ahead of time, at that age, I was not going to continue. But I worked with wonderful people at the vet school who went through all the options that we talked about, and that's what we did. But I don't know. It always seemed like... I never saw a lot of repeats in all the years I was here. You would, you would get it, you yeah. know, like maybe the ones that were like dressage horses or, or didn't live a normal horse life. That sounds terrible. <laughs> they didn't live a normal horse life. So they tended to colic more often or had repeat yeah. issues. I had one horse at a jumper yeah. barn where we got him through it. And it's like, whatever you do, please don't travel to another show. Like, I yeah. mean, keep him here. And he went to Vermont and he came back and then it was like, it was game over, you yeah. know what I mean? But so, so I think it depends, it depends. on the situation. It it always, does. I'm it like, depends. I hate copying out and saying it depends because that's what but I always tell the best students, but it really does. It, really it always does. depends, it depends on, the, on, on the their, horse. Life, their mm -hmm. lifestyle. Yeah. Yep. My horse, since that happened in 2003, she was two and a half years old and she's going to be 19 in the spring, but it seems like every year, maybe once a year, maybe once a a little bit longer or twice a year that she'll end up with gas colic mm -hmm. and a dose of anamine and walking her and walking yep. her. Um, and I stall her for the night and then she's fine the next morning. So I, you know, I don't know if it, she happens to also be a cribber, which I, uh, I have not put a collar on her. Okay. I, just, I just can't. That's okay. I would be more suspicious but, of that. You know, <laughs> but, you know, and I, 
got a metal uh, grain bin now because she was b breaking all the plastic ones. But mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's why or just my vet thought maybe barometric changes, just something upsets her. But, you know, she'll go down and get up and walk around and go down. And mm -hmm. But um, once I get her through the band line, most of the time and um, whatever, she's fine. So I don't know if... I've just been lucky so far, or somehow she just happens to be gassy, and if, as you know, and it's you know, it doesn't get any worse. Yeah, but I don't know what's causing. It. Yeah, I guess I've just been lucky. Yeah. yeah. Oh. brings to mind the question: Do you walk or do you not walk? Because old timers say walk, and then now I keep hearing you don't walk them. I think I say as long as it's safe. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I had a horse growing up, and she, like, she severely caught right? And it was in my mind, like, I got to get her up. I got, I mean, to the point where, like, I was risking my life to try and get her up and walk. And so I think it's one of those situations where, um, depending on what's going on, walking them sometimes distracts them. I mean, I still am a proponent of like throwing them on the trailer for a bumpy trailer, trailer ride if they have a gas or they're just, you know what I mean? And just enough to kind of try and reset and whether that's science or not, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I think if it's safe for you to walk them and it's not going to stress them leaving their buddies and um, they're not going to keep going down while you're on the other end of the lead rope, like I think I walk. So if they go down, do you let them go down? Uh, again, I, if if keeping them up is gonna hurt, like put you in danger, yeah. I mean, I would. I mean, I guess the years of practice, it, it flopped, right? Because I was I was horse owner, and then I was vet, and my job was to treat the horse, but I also had to keep everybody safe. And so we'd walk into these situations, and I'd be pulling owners out of the, and I, I recognize like it's emotional to go in there, um, but I, I think you know keeping yourself safe and your family safe and everyone in that situation safe um, while your vet gets there, I think is the most important thing to do. So. I just wanted to say that the other thing to consider is that there's probably not enough proof that it's helpful yeah. to both risk yourself and to um, the sad scenarios are when the people think they have to walk the horse right. to make them better. And the horse is like exhausted because it's been walking for five mm -hmm. hours. Right. That's what I mean. So it's not enough proof that it's helpful to warrant all of like risking yourself mm -hmm. and the horse and stuff. But I think, yeah, if it's maybe mild colic, that's yeah. usually and not like walking for hours, like no. like Lizzie said. I mean, like you know, 10, 15 minute walk, put them back in the salsa that they're gonna do. You know what I mean? And if that's your indication, like I've given Ban, I mean, I took them for a walk, I put them back in, they're colicking. You know what I mean? Like, and I haven't called the vet yet. Like now would be the time to call the vet. Yeah, and always pulling the food, always pulling the food when they're showing signs of colic and and. Um, you know, even if you give them banamine and they start to like perk up and feel better, um, I, I, and if you're decide not to call the vet, even though I think you should call the vet every time, um, even if it's just to have a conversation with your vet and the vet says, okay, well, they respond to banamine, they're comfortable, hold the food half normal in the morning or a quarter normal in the morning, if they're still doing okay, you know I mean? Because we just talked about if they're fasted or if they have something going on, we can have this hypomotility that happens. Um, and so, or there could be an impaction somewhere. And if you're not gonna have someone feel, or even if we feel, even if we feel and everything's clear, I still hold them or, or gradually refeeding them to make sure that they're comfortable as I'm adding food back in. So that would be the other thing is like, don't just offer them food after you give them the bandmaid and you walk them um, because you could be adding more things to an issue that's going to then kind of add to possibly an impaction or something else going on there. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, with with that too, I always start walking and then I've had my Pam Carner, my vet that I had before. She's like, if she does go down and she's not rolling, if she just seems to be, you know, she's tired and, and she's comfortable mm -hmm. and she's not doing that, then it's okay to let her, you know, and then, it, but if she starts to roll again, then try to get her back try. up. Try, yeah. But if it's safe. Right. So if it's yes, safe. Yeah. It's safe. Yeah. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Since hay and pelleted feeds are lacking in salt, probably best to, uh, it, it depends on what your horse is doing. It's just maintenance. Tablespoon top dress on your hay will encourage the horse to drink. Yep. And because that's what you want, you want to get the water in. Yeah. And I mean, I actually didn't have that in the prevention. That's a great thing. It's like making sure they have a salt lick available to them to um, 
all this, the white salt lick, right? It's Cause they'll, they'll go to the salt, but certainly, yeah, I have people that add additional salt to try and, you know, get them to drink more. Some people do electrolytes um, intermittently. Um, again, like if they you know, have a big competition, they sweat a lot, you know, what do we want to replenish, you know, some electrolytes, try and get them to drink more. I mean, there's different ways that we try to do things. Pelleted mashes um, don't necessarily, I mean, it adds a little bit of water, it makes us feel good. I used to do it, um, but uh, you know, we don't know how, how much, but yes, yeah, salt definitely. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. I also just quickly wanted to say you might have seen um, when you were coming in. So we don't have a January seminar. We're taking a break, but it's to plan the February hospital tour. So um, we're you may have been to our hospital tour last year. We're going to do another one this coming year, 2020. We're going to do an equine hospital tour. Um, different stations. Different stations so we'll the last time, yeah. So, you know, same building, but yeah. 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 everything else. Um, and we'll get you more details soon. Yeah. Thanks, guys. A long ways. It would take probably a really long extension for the phone to take eight or Okay. 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 Okay.